Hello, uh, my name is Matthew Lyons. I'm a freelance writer and historian. Among other things, that means that in practice I'm lucky enough to work uh, from home. So sometimes I work here uh, on my sofa in the living room. And sometimes I like to work here uh, in my daughter's bedroom, uh, when she's not staying here, um, which I, I like because it reminds me of uh, my kids' childhoods and it gives me a sense of connectedness to our shared past together and also to their futures, which obviously stretch out uh, beyond uh, my life. And I uh, also like working in here because it connects me to uh, my own childhood. Um, as you can possibly see behind me, uh, the room has uh, my mum's uh, dressing table in it, uh, which is the only, uh, actually the only item of furniture I have now from uh, my parents' house. And uh, I, I mean, I remember as a child, I used to lean both the uh, side mirrors on hinges and uh, I used to lean in and uh, you could uh, Fold, fold the side mirrors in and get endless versions of yourself refracting into this sort of strange kind of interior distance back into the past and sort of seemingly into the future. Uh, sorry, but I'm digressing. Uh, mostly, actually, uh, I work here at uh, what I sometimes call the kitchen table, I sometimes call the dining table, and sometimes just the table because uh, it's really in a kind of no man's land on the uh, landing in our flat, as you can possibly see. So it's a space that's really just defined by uh, how uh, I decide to use it at any given time. As I say, I'm uh, very lucky to be able to work the way that I do, and I'm um, so lucky really that I don't often stop to reflect on uh, my good fortune. Except now, uh, when I no longer have any choice in the matter, and uh, my experience of the same space has uh, changed entirely. And what was once uh, liberty is now uh, actually a kind of confinement. It's a version of something I think uh, all of us are, are feeling right now. Uh, most of us have lost the freedom to leave our houses and flats at will. Uh, and I know from uh, talking to people on social media and on, on the phone and so on how difficult uh, many of us are finding that. Um, meanwhile, um, there are many people also working in the health service and in the food industry and other essential services. Um, who are being denied the freedom to keep themselves safe at home. So you have uh, two different constrictions, two different kinds of confinement, uh, each mirroring the other. I've been thinking a lot, actually, uh, on and off uh, about confined spaces and how we use them, uh, because uh, for a few years now I've been working on the dissolution of the monasteries, uh, the brief period towards the end of the 1530s when Henry VIII and Thomas Cromwell uh, destroyed around uh, 850 uh, religious houses across England and Wales and uh, erased about a thousand years of uh, history. It's been quite a learning curve for me actually uh, because I was uh, raised an atheist. At least I, I think my parents would probably have said that I was brought up to make up my own mind but um, in, in practice I don't think that's really quite how it worked. Um, although I can see now that um, these things are much more complicated and difficult than I think I used to think that they were. Uh, my own mother was uh, brought up to be a Catholic by her mother, who in fact hated the Catholic Church and despised it for its uh, wealth and power. So as I say, um, I think now that these things are much more complicated than I uh, used to understand, and I think a lot more um, than I used to about uh, Salman Rushdie's phrase where he talks about himself as being an atheist, but an atheist uh, with a God-shaped hole in his heart. Which itself reminds me of the poem uh, Questions About Angels by the American poet Billy Collins, which asks, If an angel fell off a cloud, would he leave a hole in a river, and would the hole float along endlessly, filled with the silent letters of every angelic word? The poem itself is uh, an extended riff on medieval theology, caricatured as uh, obsessed with the idea of how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, which is uh, obviously grossly unfair. Learning more about the dissolution and about um, the history of monasticism in, in Britain in general, uh, I've become fascinated by uh, the desire of so many uh, men and women uh, to retreat from society in, into the kind of confinement that we now uh, wish we could escape from and um, into the kind of uh, contemplation, the depth of contemplation that things like uh, contemporary things like mindfulness only really uh, reach towards. What kind of choice is it to choose uh, confinement over some kind of liberty?
and uh, what really is being affirmed in that kind of self-denial. I used to think that all monasteries and uh, all monastics, uh, which is uh, the generic term I'm going to use for both monks and nuns, uh, were alike in their retreat from the world. I know now, of course, that's not the case. Uh, I know, for instance, that uh, Benedictine communities were often found in towns and cities, um, not least because they encompass pretty much all of the religious houses that were founded uh, between the uh, retreat of Rome and the Norman Conquest. And often when they weren't founded in such places, uh, cities and towns uh, tended to build up around them anyway, people gravitating towards them as centres of uh, spiritual and economic life, as if uh, the very denial of uh, civil profane life had its own kind of gravity, its own kind of uh, power. So you get this uh, strange kind of uh, antithetical relationship where on the one hand you have the uh, everyday uh, profane civil life, of the, uh, of the outer world and on the other hand you have the uh, world behind monastic walls which is created expressly to deny the life that goes on uh, outside them and the two worlds reflect and balance and nourish and support each other in, a, in, a, in quite an unusual relationship. Meanwhile when the uh, Cistercians arrived here in uh, the 12th century um, they sought out uh, desert places, wildernesses, wild places um, which is why there's so many of them in Yorkshire, um, and they, they would go so far as to uh, purge any villages um, that uh, fell uh, within their lands. In that way, they freed themselves from the constraints of certain kinds of duty to the uh, world around them, and also ensure that they were free to uh, constrain themselves in ways that uh, they felt most uh, suited their calling. Isolation then uh, comes in different forms, uh, even among uh, monastic orders, and I find it fascinating how um, these two things, freedom and confinement, freedom and constraint, uh, pull at each other in so many different ways. But even behind a monastery's wall, uh, there are different kinds of retreat. Um, some monastics in positions of authority could barely retreat from the world at all. Um, abbots and abbesses had to deal with local, national and uh, even sometimes international politics. Some uh, dealt with the buying and selling of food, uh, others with uh, land management in, in various ways, um, and of course uh, some had to deal with uh, looking after the uh, poor and the sick and the elderly, and both within the houses and, and more generally within, within the local communities, uh, and of course with giving of arms. Um, because uh, monastic houses in uh, medieval England were essentially the health service, such as it was. Uh, and of course, uh, some of them uh, had to deal with uh, education. So, in, in lots of different ways, uh, the demands of civil, profane life, um, the thing that they had rejected in the first place, meant that they couldn't, uh, that they were constrained from pursuing to the full the spiritual and contemplative calling that had led them to uh, a monastic life uh, in the first place. Of course others within monastic communities um, did have uh, much more time for the uh, Catholic rituals of the daily offices and prayers for the dead and so on and for the kind of um, contemplative study of the Bible, of the Church Fathers and of uh, a study of really every kind of learning and philosophy available to them. But the people who fascinate me the most, I think, are the anchorites and the anchoresses, um, or solitaries, to use a uh, non-gendered term, um, who sought uh, even greater isolation within the uh, already self-imposed isolation of the monastic houses. Because solitaries were actually uh, walled into their cells uh, for the rest of their lives. Um, cells were often built into or alongside um, their churches. Um, death rites were said for them, and they no longer were seen to uh, belong among the living. They were sort of unmoored from all human civil life. So the cells that they were walled into became, in a way, kind of void spaces, and uh, they too were seeking a kind of holy emptiness, uh, retreating into, uh, retreating entirely into a kind of interior space, seeking to find God in the denial of themselves, and uh, hoping to fill 
that sort of emptiness, that space inside them uh, with the light of eternity. They sought, um, if you like, to turn the small spaces they lived in inside out to welcome all of God's love, all of uh, the whole light of creation, the unfallen world of Eden, um, Eden being a, 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 a good example, a, a primal example of the kind of in space that Andy Kesson was talking about on uh, this um, channel um, uh, a few days ago, um, to, uh, hoping to empty all of that into themselves. To borrow a phrase from Shakespeare, they sought a great reckoning in a little room. The 14th century Augustinian monastic uh, Walter Hilton uh, wrote uh, a book uh, addressed to an unnamed uh, anchoress, um, a book called The Scale of Perfection. Uh, and and uh, in it, uh, he, t he talks about the anchoress uh, throughout as his ghostly sister. Um, by ghostly, uh, he mostly means spiritual, I think, um, but the other meanings of ghostly uh, also hang in the air, sort of immaterial, not of this world, dead but alive. From that vantage point, uh, anchorites and anchoresses um, were closer to the truth of the world than uh, almost anyone else, and indeed some of them were sought out for counsel and comfort. Um, offering uh, advice and wisdom through uh, the small apertures in, in, in their walls through which they um, were able to observe uh, the rituals of the church. The best known solitary is probably Julian of Norwich, a 14th century mystic uh, who, whose own actual birth name you know, is lost to us. And, and she's known uh, not least because T.S. Eliot quotes from her in uh, Little Gidding, the last of his uh, four quartets, written at least in part uh, during the air raids on Britain in the early part of World War II. The lines he borrows from her when he was searching for meaning in the destruction of war and death's eternal certainty, uh, when he says, the intersection of the timeless moment is England and nowhere, when he's searching for light and language to fill his own emptiness, uh, a hole that kind of gnawed away at his own certainties, at his sense of self, the, the lines he borrows from Julian of Norwich are, All shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. What, I wonder, made Elliot reach back to the words of a 14th century anchoress to comfort his deepest fears? And likewise, what about her isolation, her search for God, allowed her to find the words to offer peace of mind to a troubled, lost soul over 500 years later? What did he see of himself reflected in her thoughts? reflected but made whole, the perfect light to his imperfect shadow. Thinking about these questions uh, makes me think of the Benedictine historian uh, David Knowles, who, was, uh, who must have been working on his history of monasticism in uh, England uh, at around the same time as Eliot was working on the four quartets. Knowles, writing about why those in search of all kinds of wisdom, uh, not merely solace, sought advice from monastics, um, says in a, in a lovely phrase of, of monastics that they offered not just their own counsel, but also had the long memory of an undying family to draw upon. The dreads and confinements we're experiencing now uh, may be new to us, but echoes and traces of them are, are surely to be found uh, deep in, a, in our cultural memory, just as what we do now will be there for our descendants, facing privations and crises we can't imagine hundreds of years from now. Which is another way of saying that uh, although we might be isolated in space, we are not isolated in time. Lots of us right now have life-shaped holes in our hearts to go with other losses and sorrows and griefs we may have accrued over the years and which we carry still within us. And perhaps with so much of the world in a kind of silence, we have the chance to contemplate the meaning of these absences floating through us and the chance to share these meanings like an anchorite through whatever windows are for the moment open to us. <laughs>